one of the one of the questions I, I want to kind of throw a couple things at you. Uh, you know, having made records through eras of technology, um, I love when when you and I first got in the studio uh, back at my place in Malibu. Um, I think it was right when Driver's License, the Olivia Rodrigo record, had come yeah. out, and you and I listened to that and both just marveled at how great it was. Uh, just yes. a, a nineteen-year-old singer-songwriter writing just a, a soul, heart-melting, crushing, breaking song. Um, Agreed. So many records now, obviously, technology has allowed so many people to make mm -hmm. records. Uh, how has that changed how you think about making records? I mean, you know, you and I, I think we, the, the stuff we worked on, I was just basically producing in Ableton and, and moving quickly. Yeah. Do, do you prefer a certain way to make records? Do you, do you like to integrate technology? I mean, obviously, like from... I do. I mean, I wish I, I, wish I, would, I, wish I was better at it myself. I mean, I've often thought... I really should take like a month and really learn how to do Pro Tools or, or Ableton or Logic or whatever myself and not have to rely on people so that I could sit and try out ideas alone, which is very appealing. Whereas what I do mostly do now is if I do program something, it's like a loop to work with or something, you know, and, and, um, uh, I am still used mostly to working with live musicians. You still, the the modern thinking has certainly changed the way you build up tracks. You don't necessarily get everyone in at once, but I still generally rely on musicians. Many of them, my favorite musicians, I've worked with for you know decades. Um, but yes, I I watch Victoria and her friends and and you make records, you know, uh, and kind of go, I I should figure out how to do that, but I haven't. You know, I I do it in conjunction with someone who, who's good at it, like you. Um, or, you know, Victoria might play me something she's working on with friends and I'll make a suggestion or two. But can I reach for the keyboard and go, how about this? No, I can't. And it might be useful if I could. And then the other half of me goes, eh, you know, because you, you start learning how to do that and you think you're getting somewhere and then you sit next to someone who really knows how to do it. And it's, you go, oh, God, you know, that what took me and, you know, a long time thinking was them just going diddly diddly on the keyboard and it's all done <laughs> you know take this bit of backgrounds put it here you know tune it and then it's done before you finish the sentence it's crazy the old diddly diddly on the computer i, I admire that a lot <laughs> to, you know exactly it looks like they're writing it a life story but actually what they've done is done exactly what you asked <laughs> well it's it's something that i think <clears throat> everybody is going to have to start doing i mean i i find myself doing it in my 30s you know, when I work, I, I like working with 20 year old producers and collaborate yeah. with them because they just do things I don't do. And as much as I'm very fluent on Pro Tools and Ableton, all these things, you know, the, it, it feels like technology is moving so quickly that you kind of have to reference, if you're going to make contemporary records, you have to reference what teenagers have access to technologically in order yeah. to make things that are relevant. Um, were, was there, I mean, I think of the eras. You know, I, I worked mm. under uh, Eric Valentine for a long time and so learned how to calibrate tape machines and things like that. But y when you started uh, as an artist, it was all like four tracks, right? And yes. I assume, yes. did, did you, cause it went from there pretty quickly to eight and 16 and then it was that for a while. Did you, did that open up production wise? Like how, how did you- Well, yes, it did. Program? I mean, the, the, the transition in my case, uh, was the, the, the James Taylor album for Apple that we um, discussed before, earlier. Uh, I Because I knew I wanted to put these string quartet additions and, and brass and percussion and all this on there, I wanted to, I specifically wanted to make it 8-track. And, and we knew that 8-track existed. We equally knew that the studio we were working in, which was EMI Studios, subsequently renamed Abbey Road, didn't have it. Turns out right. they actually did. They had one in a back room that they were taking apart and rebuilding because it had to be brought up to EMI's standards, it had to be rebuilt for CCIR, Curve, and Guys all in lab cuts. Tech. Exactly, yeah. which was what EMI was like. Yeah. Whereas over at Trident Studios, which I'd heard of, they just ordered one, took it out of the box, plugged it in, and recorded. And, and so I went over to Trident, to, from EMI in order to use 8-track. So that James Taylor album was the first thing I ever did uh, in 8-track, which was 68, I guess. And the 
the interesting footnote to that is Paul McCartney came over to Trident to play bass for me on that song Carolina in my mind on the original version. And uh, that was the first time he'd ever recorded an eight track. And he subsequently brought the Beatles from EMI over to Trident uh -huh. where they recorded Hey Jude, which is a session I had the privilege of being at. And that was the, that was the first time they'd ever used eight tracks. Very interesting. But yes, from there, yes, 8, 16, and then of course digital, 32, I mean 16, 24, digital, 32, 48, and then the tape went away forever. And I wasn't sorry to see it go. I mean, I admire people who, who you know, they because people go to me, oh, it's so great you worked in the golden age of, you know, tape. Mm. Well, yes, but People forget, you know, those big heavy reels and they forget tones and you forget azimuth alignment. You forget the fact that every time that you played the tape, you got just that little bit duller until eventually you went back and listened to an outtake on another reel. And wow, that hi-hat is all crisp and it's gone, never to return. So, you know, and then I remember trying Linda Ronsat's extraordinary voice on different kinds of tape stock to figure out which one came closest to handling it properly. You know, in, in England, it was Agva versus Bass F, I guess, and right. Emmy tape and all that stuff. And none of them were perfect. You had to kind of choose which one, which kind of bad recording is the least bad, you know. So, and once they got digital straightened out and got decent converters and Apogee came along and all that, I started to like digital better anyway. I, I so love it's, yeah, it's, it, yeah, you know, I, I understand the nostalgia for tape, but honestly, I, I think some of it's got a bit mythological now. It's just like when, when I first heard that people were putting the crickly crackly noise from, from vinyl I, into their recordings, they go, we spent years trying to get rid of that, you know, <laughs> we hated it. And now it's a, now it's a, now it's a thing, you know, it's weird. Well, it is. I, I love one of the reasons I love I love talking to you and and, uh, and and hearing this from you is that you you really are about I think the songs and the singer and not nostalgic for a certain era of how things should sound or how they should be. Uh, it's a really important thing I think for a lot of young record makers to hear that you know you get attached to a lot of people get attached to doing things a certain way. And then they ascribe some sort of nostalgic value to how they're used to doing things instead of embracing technology or challenging themselves to do new things. And it's great to hear that you continue to do that. I mean, I, I, I hope to continue to make records for decades. And I feel like that's the key to unlocking it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm super excited every time there's some new technology. So, so you know, when the moment they go, oh look, Melodyne can now do this, I'll go, how cool is that? Brilliant, you know. Now it doesn't mean it can't be misused and won't be misused. Of course, of course it will, because um, there's a lazy way to use something to just cover up the fact you didn't do it right in the first place or whatever. But but uh, all the great musicians I know endorse it, you know, completely yeah. and 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 learn to you know, how to use it rather than misuse it. Yeah. Well, it gets exciting. I mean, it's worth thinking back. The, the day I wanted to be a record producer back then, I had no way of, of trying anything. I mean, you know, you couldn't demonstrate your ideas in any way other than having musicians in a studio and telling them what to do. There was, or, you know, because you couldn't even build a track up with a huge amount of overdubbing all on your own. It was, and let alone put, putting things in a computer or having, you know, programming drums or any of that didn't exist. Let's not forget that when Apple Computer first was founded, the idea that there would be a conflict with Apple, the Beatles company, over the use of the name was crazy. Because one's a music company, one's a computer company. They have nothing to do with each other. Yep. And not quite so. <laughs> Not quite so, indeed. Yeah, there was a was there a lawsuit recently about that? There was Multi multiple lawsuits, lawsuits back lawsuits. and forth, and they finally got it all sorted out. Yes, but I mean, at the time, you know, literally, they thought computing had nothing to do with music. Let alone the fact that you could listen to your music on a computer, make your music on a computer, store your music on a computer. They now have everything to do with each other. That's so interesting.